So welcome to the podcast for this week. Uh, this week I have a very special guest with me. We have Frank Lee from the ICW, which is the Institute of Collaborative Working. Frank is the CEO. And here we're going to be talking a little bit about what kind of work the ICW does, as well as find out a little bit more about Frank and all about the things that he gets up to when he's not working. So here we go. Frank, welcome to the show. Thanks, Rob. Nice to meet you. Nice to be down here. I say nice to meet you because we have met before. We certainly have. We certainly have. So full disclosure, myself and Frank, we used to work many, well, a few years ago, not many, many years ago. Um, and I thoroughly enjoyed working with him because I used to film him. So uh, it's kind of come back a little bit now, full circle, though. So, yeah, how, when you left the place that we were working at previously, how did you actually get into the role of the ICW? Okay, it was a really interesting one because obviously uh, we were at British Standards BSI together. Mm -hmm. um, I took my pension, I retired, I'd reached that age, and my wife said to me, well, maybe it's about time you start working these very long days, um, five days a week, checking on your emails at the weekend and started to take it a little easy. Right. I'd been involved with the Institute for many years prior to that. I was fellow number three of the Institute wow. and, and I helped with my BSI hat on many, many years ago, back in 2007, 2008, mm -hmm. on the first certification scheme in the area of collaboration, right. which was in those days for PAS 11,000. We quickly realized that PAS 11,000 didn't really work. So we moved to a British standard for BS 11,000 and I've been involved ever since I was part of that original committee. So when I uh, retired from BSI, I um, spoke to the chairman of ICW, who I knew well, uh, Lord Evans, uh, and the then chief exec. Uh, and it turned out just by coincidence, the chief executive at that time was moving on. And they said, oh, Frank, you can still do this role. And they brought me in and, and the rest is history. And my wife is still telling me <laughs> I need to stop working long days and five days a week. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah. I, I can imagine that. I mean... When it seems like it was almost a case of perfect time, perfect place, really, in a way, right? Because I think it was, yeah. yeah. Um, almost like serendipity, but yes. Yeah. Uh, and it's been a great challenge for me as well, moving forward. Um, but it plays, I think, very much on all the things I've done before. So I'm, yeah. I'm happy. Good, good, good. So tell me a little bit about actually the, the work of the ICW. What is it? that you guys actually do? Okay, so we are a member-driven organization. Mm -hmm. um, we are for purpose, but not for profit. Right. Which means essentially that any revenues, any surpluses uh, from our revenues that we have left at the end of the year are plowed back into the Institute, either to make it more sustainable in the future or to fund and support the research that we need to do to demonstrate the value that collaborative working, that's effective collaborative working, brings to organizations. Right. And we look to do this in a number of key areas. Firstly, there's better commercial outcomes, and that's really where collaboration has been from the very, really early days. Right. But also what we've realized, uh, certainly in the last year or so, is that if organizations collaborate effectively together, they, they, te they get better outcomes, not only in terms of commercial outcomes, but you can have a safer working environment when you have different organizations working on the same complex project, bringing different skills. If they don't collaborate, that workplace is not a safer environment as it needs to be. Right. If you've got organizations working together with very long and complex supply chains, then once we move towards net zero and a more sustainable future, then it's really important that those organizations throughout those whole supply chains collaborate together right. in order to minimize those carbon um, costs, if you like, mm -hmm. those environmental costs. But equally, anybody who thinks that they can get to net zero scope three on their own doesn't understand what net zero scope three is. Right. So collaboration is important. Yeah, And we see more and more today, unlike when I first started work, uh, it's not just about what you do, but it's about how you achieve it. Right. So we see more and more desire to create social value as we undertake capital projects, infrastructure projects. Um, and as a result of that, organizations that collaborate effectively find that they can come together and create social value as well as delivering commercial benefits. Got it. And, and, and then through the, our interactions with all the organizations, what we realize is that the cultures, behaviors, and that people need to have to work collaboratively 
are also very similar to the behaviours and culture you need in an organisation to make it more sustainable, but also to make it more diverse and more inclusive. Got it. So, so really, really about promoting collaborative working, the tools that people need to use to collaborate effectively. Mm-hmm. A lot of people cooperate and believe they're collaborating. It's that structure, that those systems, processes, competence, and culture that really result in good, effective collaboration. Right, got it. So there's lots that it seems that's going on under the hood there. I mean, you talked about sustainability, uh, you talked about safety, and then you talked about the way how complex supply chains, um, <clears throat> like you said, you know, people are tending to just cooperate, but they need something that's much more systems, processed, people focused, basically, in order to do it really, really properly. So if you can give me, uh, I guess, like a, 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 t- a typical example of a, of, a, of a member of yours, who would they be your kind of, I don't want to say ideal member, because I'm sure you've got very big and very you know small members as well and everything in between. But who are the types of people that will come to you and what are their needs when they come to you in order to be a member? So we have a, a wide variety of members, that, but the main groups that they fall into tend to either be the defense sector, infrastructure, railways, roads, etc., mm-hmm. and to some extent, FM facilities management. And if you think about those sectors, they're all areas where you have quite high risk projects, right? quite long relationships needed to deliver them, yeah, yeah. and multi, multiple partners delivering. So collaboration is really essential. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so it's organizations that tend to be involved in those areas. Okay. Um, would you ever see that it would expand into other areas as well? Or? Absolutely. We think there's enormous opportunities in the pharmaceutical and medical device areas for greater collaboration. Right. Um, uh, we certainly see some of the emerging technologies, uh, areas such as AI, for example, where we're getting increased uh, benefits. Mm-hmm. But not only in other sectors, if you like organisations within the existing sectors, but not the big players, um, tier twos, for example, where they need to collaborate both with the tier ones, but other organisations within those ecosystems is really, really important. So we're seeing a great increase in our membership at the moment, not particularly in different sectors, but actually in the types of organisations that are joining, people who really are seeing the benefits of collaboration, what it can bring to their businesses. Got it. So for those of you who don't really understand what tier one, tier two, tier three means, I mean, Frank, can you explain it a little bit? Okay, so a a typical tier one would be an organization like Costain, uh, Kia, um, Balfour BT, one of those large organizations, uh, Babcock, for example, in the defense sector, Raytheon in the defense sector. So those larger organizations that we've all heard of, household names. Tier twos tend to be the organizations who who, if you like, they are their prime contacts, their prime suppliers, who they will use on a whole multitude of projects. But more and more, um, some of the, what traditionally were tier two organizations are taking on tier one roles as well in many projects. So uh, so there's all sorts of organizations, still quite large organizations at the moment. But one of the aims of, of us as an institute is to spread the message and spread the benefits so that more types of organizations and it's not seen as something that just big organizations do. Anyone can do it. Right. And I guess, I mean, with new kind of areas opening up, like let's say, for example, with AI and, you know, the technology sphere, you're not going to get massively huge organizations. They're probably going to be fairly smallish, but they might be able to supply into yeah, these very um, large organizations in terms of people, I mean. Yeah, and what we do see, and, and, and Kinetic have done a lot of work in this area, actually, mm-hmm. uh, is is ecosystems of relatively small organizations coming together, where if you like, the sum is greater than the individual parts, right. where they're bringing lots of skills, they can work very agile, they can be, uh, they can be very nimble, mm-hmm. uh, they can be very adaptable, um, and more of those if you like, small ecosystems coming together to fulfill needs is a really uh, interesting uh, concept in collaboration. And we are starting to see more of that. And it's certainly an area that we in the Institute are interested in exploring further as we go forward as part of our, our strategy. Um, uh, but I think that's a really exciting area as well. So there really is no limit 
to the size of organization, be it very small or very large, that can, that can collaborate. It's really about the, the structures that you put in place, the processes, how you make things work smoothly, and the different projects that you want people to work upon. Got it. So if I were to say the kind of industries that you get involved in, would they tend to have trade bodies, for example, that you would work with, or would they have... Um, or would it be those industries that don't really have them? Um, they certainly do have trade bodies oh. uh, and, and <clears throat> other institutes, of course, that, that focus on specific skills and areas uh, within those uh, with all, within those uh, member organisations. Um, uh, and we will cooperate and collaborate uh, with those organisations as well. Um, but equally, you know, sometimes the trade bodies do different tasks. So, so the, in this, it's a big ecosystem, so lots of people doing different things. But yeah, they, they do, um, and we will work with those organizations as well. Got it. Okay. So uh, so we talked a little bit about customers and, you know, the, the kind of clients that you generally tend to have, not just tier ones, but moving into tier twos as well, and that's growing. Um, so congratulations. Uh do you ever foresee a day when you expand it even further into tier threes, or is that something oh, that you're not thinking of? At the oh, moment? yes, we're very keen to expand. We, My aim as part of our strategic plan over the next five years is to have member organisations representing all different groups and types of organisation. Very good. Um, we're not particularly focused outside of our core sectors at this point in time, um, but we are focused very much on different sizes of organisations within those sectors as part of that five-year plan. Got it. So it's still infrastructure, defence, and... I've, FM to some extent. And facilities uh, management, yeah. Um, <laughs> but organisations who are interacting with government is a, is a key area for us as well. E even even though maybe they didn't always fall into those particular categories, um, they're still really important to organisations because right. they tend to do higher risk activities. Got it. Okay. Is that one of the things that is maybe, I don't want to say a prerequisite, but it's, it's, it's something that um, gives you confidence that that's the right particular client that, to work with, somebody who's also got a segue into the government areas as well, or not really? Not particularly, no. Um, I mean, we do look at our members before they join. Sure. Many of our members come through recommendations from existing members. Got it. Uh, which is always nice. Good. Because <laughs> essentially someone's already done that work for you. Yes, yes, um, very true. But we, then we do, if, if we get new members to, to join or, or apply to join us, then we do do a, a, a degree of due diligence. <clears throat> and... And what we're really interested in is to try to find out whether they believe in collaboration or whether they're just looking to put a badge on the wall and say they are in right. order to, if you like, um, get some points in a tender or um, if you like, tick a box on an application that they've been sent. Um, okay. We're not really unduly worried about where they are on that journey. There can be people at the very start of the journey who are just interested in learning about collaboration. Well, that's fine. We have lots of tools, lots of things that we can do to help those organisations. And right at the other end, we have organisations um, that, if you like, have gained certification to ISO 44001, which is the, the, the international standard in this area, right. um, and are going beyond it, demonstrating real value. And again, we're working with those members to try and help them differentiate themselves from others in the pack. Sure. Um, but anywhere you are, as long as you're in that journey, we can work with you. Got it. Okay. So let's say, for example, I'm a typical uh, tier two and I'm supplying, I don't know, something maybe for facilities management. Um, how do I go about joining you and, and what's the kind of things that I would, how do I get in there basically? Okay. I, I mean, you can simply email me. All right. <laughs> okay. Lee. At icw.uk.com. Okay. Uh, or you can link with me on LinkedIn and talk to me. Right. Uh, or any of my colleagues. Um, but we welcome interests, inquiries, mm -hmm. um, contacts from any organization. And then we'll have a conversation. I'll try to find out something about you as an organization, um, uh, you know, what your ethos is, what your culture is, right. uh, what your aims are, uh, why collaboration appeals to you mm -hmm. um if you like try to work out where on that journey you are um yeah. and then try to find a pathway to work with you yeah. um but yeah we're keen to talk to and meet anybody who's interested in in what we do and of course we have strong links into academia 
Um, we have some affiliate organizations that we work closely with who maybe have collaborative skills that we don't have in house, but complement our our skills. Uh, and our links with academia in, in universities at Warwick, Cardiff, and at Leeds mm -hmm. are strong ones for us as well um, in fostering the value of collaboration and making sure people understand it. Oh, good. That's very, very good to hear. So, Frank, when you joined and you heard about the position, and obviously you knew it a little bit, I guess, from the inside out, to be fair. But what were the reasons why you decided, yeah, I, I think I should go for this? I think potential. When I looked at the Institute, I realized that there was enormous potential for this Institute to be something very, very special. Right. Um, when I looked at the size of it, the membership, I saw some of our members who are really great organizations, key organizations. We simply didn't have enough of them. Right. Um, when I looked at the driving forces, the benefits that we could bring to the communities that we live within, yeah. then that was something that really excited me and interested me. Yeah. And I come to, you know, I'd, on the 17th of September this year, I celebrate paying my taxes for 50 years solid. So um, you don't do that just to go off and, if you like, work for some organization that's just about making more money. Yeah. So what I was really interested in, what I am interested in, is working with an organization that wants to do something that, that benefits the society that we're all part of as well. And right. I believe with collaboration and with the Institute, we can really do that. Many of the projects that our members are working on really do bring benefits to the communities that they're in and, the na and our nation to help us grow. Yeah. But actually, just working better to help us become a more diverse society, a more inclusive society, to help organizations work together to get people home safe at night, mm -hmm. to help organizations work together to create social value from the projects that they're undertaking, or to help us get down to net zero one day, right. I think is worth doing. Uh, and so really that was the motivation for me. Um, you know, I'd done a, a good number of years working, um, and I'm not ready to hang my boots up just yet. You knew there'd be a football analogy, Rob, because you know <laughs> I love football. I know you do. Um, I'm not ready to hang my boots up just yet, but I wanted to do something that is worthwhile. Yeah. And actually, um, nothing to do particularly with anything we're actively working on in the Institute. But if you look at government's uh, agenda for levelling up in the UK, right? a term I absolutely don't care for actually. I, I much prefer the term raising up to leveling up because leveling up always means that you're bringing, to me, I visualize someone coming down so they join in the middle. Got it. Oh, yeah. As I'm thinking of raising people up to the highest level. Sure. Um, but without good collaboration between private, public sector, third sector, uh, uh, arm's length government bodies who maybe improve transport links and the like, it's hard to imagine that any policy on raising parts of this country up would be successful. So I am very, very keen that in, the, in my tenure here in the Institute that we do something in that area as well, to, in that, that area as well, so that we're able to support those communities who really do need raising up. Right, got it. So there is definitely some sort of social impact motivation behind the reasons why you, why you took the position, which and, is admirable. I mean, you know. And, and I wasn't ready just to finish and all um, yeah. at, at that stage. And and I have been involved in the Institute for the best part of 15 years prior to joining. Um, yeah. Plus the tra chairman's an old friend and he persuaded me as well. <laughs> <laughs> he twisted your arm. Uh, so um, now you've you've got the position and, and, and you've been working in it. Uh, what, I mean, where are you currently at? And, and I guess, where would you like to take it? Okay, so... Um, I joined at the uh, the end of last year, mm -hmm. um, and the first thing I set about doing was producing a five-year strategic plan for where I want this institute to be in that in five years from now, four and a half years from now. Yes, um, that will involve uh, making it a far more robust and sustainable organisation for the future. So we will double revenues over that time period, and we will increase our surpluses significantly from where they are today. Our membership will increase by 45% and we will revamp our training packages so that we are able to offer as wide a range of training to our members as we possibly can. Right. And our non-members who, who wish to, if you like, get on that journey with us. Got it. Um, 
That, I think, will make will ensure that the Institute is in a good and stable position to move forward and can start to do some of the key things that we need to do with academia, supporting research, um, developing new methodologies. Because one thing that's for certain is that the all the rigid methodologies that people have traditionally used and the all the rigid ways of contracting that people have traditionally used in collaborative relationships probably won't work if we're working on projects to get us down to net zero or probably won't work if we're working in very, very long supply chains around the world where you almost never meet the person that you're collaborating with. Right. And they certainly won't work in an area where we are using more and more AI yeah. in order to make our decisions. Yeah. So uh, we need to look at methodologies that are more agile uh, and more fitting for the second half of the century that we are now in. Yeah. If we don't start to do that now, then they won't be available when we need them. So so it's absolutely crucial for me that we build the structures uh, and do the research and the work that needs to be done to make this a more sustainable way of working going forward. Uh, and so that's the key things for me. So it seems like sustainability is something that's really, really driving the agenda right now, because like you said, I mean, all the others are there as effectively mechanisms of being able to do work, but if it's not sustainable, it's not going to be sustainable, I guess, in the long run. That's correct. And, and the institute itself needs to be sustainable as well. We need to make sure that our training is as up-to-date as it can be, mm -hmm. that the publications <laughs> that, we put, that we put out there as, as thought, that the amount of thought leadership we do increases significantly so that we can plot the way forward for people in the future. Right. And of course, thought leadership is a key aim of the institute. Okay. And with thought leadership, I mean, how would, so I join tomorrow and then afterwards, what, how would I experience the thought leadership that you, you have? Okay, so probably you'd experience it in the first instance through the publications, our partner magazine that we, 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 uh, um, that we publish will be an early one and, and our internal insight magazine will have thought leadership. But also... Kia in Kia is through our share and learns that we run online and through the networking and other events that we do where we promote and make available uh, and present to our members on that thought leadership. But actually, I think the best way you can really take advantage of the thought leadership is by being part of it and getting your teams to be part of it. Right. Um, so our members are able to take part in any of our thought leadership activities that they choose to do so. Okay. And it's not just the key focal point, but we are really keen that uh, that we spread that throughout our member organisations so that they're able to bring uh, their teams in to take part in various areas. So it could be that, you know, if we're doing a, some thought leadership on collaborative behaviours, for example, mm -hmm that you might say, well, maybe we want someone from our people team to get involved in that rather than someone from our technical team. Yeah. Um, so um, so I think it's really important. That's To, to me, that's a key thing. If, if members want to get involved, they can come to the things where we share, where they can learn, uh, where they can hear about those things. But come and get involved. Yeah. Be part of it. Yeah. So you're trying to make that ecosystem where they do feel, I guess, also a, a certain level of comfortable uh, comfort to be able to come in and just participate and get involved more. Yeah, and, and it's like anything else. No, no one will force you to speak at the beginning so you can come along, you can join, and you can sit there for a few meetings and absorb. Mm -hmm. um, but I think pretty soon everybody starts to make a contribution. You can't sit in the room and uh, yeah. uh, uh, and stay silent for too long. And, yeah. of course, these days it's really convenient because quite a lot of our thought leadership takes part uh, online. Mm -hmm. So it may be for an hour in the day, maybe early in the day, maybe later in the day. Right. Um, so it's it's not like you're traveling long distances to join these other organizations. And the real benefits to you as an organization and to your people from being part of this is phenomenal because you get to network and to work and to hear and to understand the challenges that other people are facing in, in different sectors on many occasions. So you can get cross-sector fertilization of good ideas mm -hmm. all within the same sectors. Uh, but the benefits are it helps your people grow. It helps them develop both as people yeah. and as professionals. Um, uh, and I have to say, I've been part of, I was part of a, a thought leadership forum, a, a special interest group a couple of years ago mm -hmm. um, before I joined the Institute right. on the future of collaboration. Okay. Um, 
And it was a fantastically rewarding experience. Uh, and I met some great people who I still, I'm still in contact with. And that's you sometimes when I have a question or a sort of challenge, uh, I'll call them up. Yeah. And we'll have a, we'll talk it through. Yeah. Um, yeah. In fact, it happened on just last Thursday, I think I spoke to someone Very good. Um, who'd been in that thought leadership group um, just to calibrate myself. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a really useful way of, of, of developing your people. Yeah. And I guess, I guess that that's also the other benefit really of, of collaborating because, you know, as, as you alluded to just there, it's, it's something that helps you um, gauge or benchmark yourself because you've got a second, third, fourth person to kind of run it by, you know, what do you think about this really? And yeah, that's sometimes just what you need in order to make really good decisions, right? It is. Um, just having that reassurance that, you know, other people in this room think that's a sensible thing. Yeah. And of course we try to make them very safe places. So, and encourage positive challenge. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and positive challenge, I think is really important because yeah. if you don't get that positive challenge, you, you go away in blind ignorance thinking every ignorance thinking everything, everything that you do is right. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's true, actually. I mean, when, whenever, you know, the, the traditional sense of, of, of many, um, the traditional way of, 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 of approaching that is that often you would gain feedback, but sometimes it's good to have somebody actually positively challenge you and say, well, it's not just me telling you what, what to think. It is kind of me challenge you, challenging you whether what you're thinking is good enough, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. 100%. Yeah. So it's not a transferal of idea. It's for you to almost kind of coach yourself into thinking that, yes, there is a potentially a better way out there. I might just not have found it as yet, yep. which is a big difference, really. <laughs> and the other person doesn't even need to know the better way out. Mm. Um, sometimes it's just encouraging you to go and have a look. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. So uh, when you've done this, uh, okay, so you've got the organization and you'd like to grow it by a certain amount, you know, you're talking about doubling revenues and everything else. You've established the what you're going to do right? And I know the trickiest part is always actually the how it's implemented. What are the things that you think you will need in order to start doing those, to start doing the how, I guess? Okay. Well, I think for me, the key thing is that members have to be front and center of everything we do. We are okay. a member-driven organization. Our members are the most important thing to us. So everything we do is all about members. The very first thing I did when I came into the Institute was to uh, appoint my good friend and colleague, Adrian Miller, to be membership services director, because I wanted us to make sure that we were providing services that our members both valued and needed. Right. So it's really is about making sure we're doing that. And actually a lot of the thought leadership that I've spoken about is absolutely pivotal there. Mm -hmm. Our members love to be part of that thought leadership landscape. They love to be part of the solution. They love to have the opportunity to present to other members about the progress the special interest groups and collaborative forums that they're part of have achieved. Right. We also need to put on events, bringing experts in from other fields. Um, linking with our friends in academia. Um, again, so that we're providing real member benefits. So our first big event this year uh, will be with Leeds University, University Business School um, on the 3rd of October. Um, and we'll be talking about collaboration and social value, right. which is a key topic and one close to my heart, as you probably gather, but very, also, yes, yes. also very close to the hearts of, of many of our members. Um, uh, and we'll have some real experts talking uh, at that event. So it's a great learning opportunity for our members and other people who are able to join us at uh, that event in Leeds. Mm -hmm. so, so key things for me are providing benefits to members, doing lots of thought leadership and putting on events that our members really appreciate and get value from. And then, of course, you support that with other publications and training materials as well so that we're able to help an organisation wherever they are on their journey. Mm -hmm. And then also being available to members. So I spent an awful lot of time this year getting out and about meeting members. So not my all of our members, you know, they still have a mission to do so. Yeah, um, yes. I'm working on it. Um, 
Uh, but that's also really important because it tells me what they want from the inst from their institute. Sure, sure. Um, and I always talk about our institute, not the institute. It's all about our institute. When all I'm a member, I pay my membership fees every year. Yes, so you know, yes. so uh, so it really is about making sure we're providing that value to them. Yeah, uh, and then we invest in the institute. Uh, to make sure that we're sustainable for the future, make sure we're bringing new skills in mm -hmm. and we're developing our base materials so that, again, we can support our members wherever they are in their journey. Got it. Okay. So that's a bit about the how you're going to make everything happen. There obviously has been some major disruption that we all know that's taking place in the world. You even mentioned it just a few minutes ago with artificial intelligence and so on. How is that... Um, I guess, for want of a better word, impacting you or making you think differently about how things will pan out over the next few years? Or is it, and have you got anything in place to help it? So obviously, artificial intelligence, AI, uh, I don't think any of us really know how it's going to affect our lives as we go forward. I think True. all we know is that it will. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit like forecasting what's going to happen this year. The only certain thing I can tell you with any certainty is that there's uncertainty ahead. <laughs> um, true, so, true. But AI is definitely going to be an impact uh, upon us. So a number of our members, uh, Babcock in the defense sector, of course, uh, Lidos and Globin, who are key of our members, are, are organizations that are clearly looking at these issues as part of their everyday business. I'm certain of it. Mm -hmm. um, we will be looking with them and with other members at how we adapt collaborative models going forward to take advantage of the opportunities that AI bring. Mm -hmm. And also maybe to look at the, 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 if you like, dispelling some of the myths, the negative myths about yeah, AI. Yeah, that's true. So uh, actually we will, in conjunction with one of our members, Globant, um, before the end of this year, be running a a seminar uh, in Westminster in conjunction with them uh, on AI and how collaboration and AI will be coming together. Wow. So that's the first one that we're working on this year. That's incredible, um, actually. I mean, it sounds like something that's super interesting because it was a natural segue into like, not just collaborating with individuals, uh, people, humans, but collaborating with something that is a machine effectively. Um, yeah, or, or how that machine, how that uh, AI influences the decisions that we make right. uh, and, and the way we collaborate. And I don't think any of us know yet, but one of the things and one of the missions for us in the Institute is to research this, make sure we start to understand it and start to adapt our methodologies to ensure that our members uh, are the first in line when it comes to taking advantage of these opportunities that undoubtedly will come along. Definitely. And if you haven't signed up for that, I mean, I would strongly encourage you to visit the ICW's website find out a bit more information about it so that you can get yourself in there. Yeah, tickets are going to be in short supply for that one, I'll Absolutely. tell you. I'll make sure I book mine. <laughs> it's very interesting that your, your analogy with uh, a service in a restaurant. Um, I think AI in the future will play a big part in some of the large projects that we see, mm. uh, particularly in, in the world where maybe resources are becoming scarce. And of course, one of the great things about collaboration is in the scarce resource, in a world of a scarce resource in terms of people and skills, then actually if you collaborate, you get access to skills that you maybe don't have. Yes. Which is great. I think AI will also start to make decisions for us in the future. Um, and I think that will be very, very interesting that people need to collaborate between one another on a project, but also take on trust that certain things are done which they haven't had an input into and it's been done through AI. Yeah. Maybe not in the immediate future, but I think that will come in, in time. That sounds um, very true. We we'll always think about restaurants. I don't think this is any point in this discussion at all, but yeah. good service in a restaurant, bad service can completely ruin a perfectly good meal. And great service is the icing on the cake to make a nice night a really special one. True. Very, very true. Isn't that funny that you said that? Because effectively, when I thought about the, the analogy just now, I gave them equal weighting. But in fact, service needs to have a higher weighting level. Because like you said, yeah, you can have, you know, 10 out of 10 yeah, fine dining meal, but yeah, you have a horrible waiter that's gone straight out the window. You will never go back there again. But a great waiter has you going back the following day. Yeah, yeah. You could have had a McDonald's. Well, maybe not McDonald's, but you know what I mean? Yeah, you can have something really good or good-ish and still want to go back for more. Yeah. Get it. I got it. Um, 
so yeah, yeah, that, that was a nice little segue actually. Uh, with all this AI stuff though, I mean, just generally speaking, it's, you, you hear a lot of people uh, talking about like all the worst case scenarios because everybody's like always scared about their jobs and whatnot. And I, you know, I completely get it. But because we sit so closely with all the Google stuff, we understand that it's more of an enabler at this point in time. It's not like going to completely displace people's jobs or anything like that as yet. But um, I mean, when they're talking to you from an institute of collaborative working, what like what are people saying to you about AI in their industry? I think everyone is talking about the the opportunities that AI can bring to their opportunities, to their industries in the future. Right. I don't think people are yet clear on exactly what benefits it will bring and how it will bring them. Mm -hmm. I think it's almost instinctive that there will be benefits. Um, and I think if you go back through history, um, we've always been inventing new ways to do things quicker and more efficiently. And people worry about jobs uh, on AI. Mm -hmm. Um, the one thing that my life has taught me is that getting in the way of progress doesn't work. Um, uh, all it does is, is perhaps speed up the demise of an industry uh, in the longer term. Um, we've got more people in this country than we've ever had before, and that means, and we've also got more people working in this country than we've ever had before, mm -hmm. despite all the things that were supposed to put people out of jobs for many, many years. Sure. So I don't see AI as a threat to jobs. Mm -hmm. I see it as a way that we can make our society better if we use it well. Yeah, yeah. And the onus is on us to do the latter, to use it well and to use it for the benefits of, of our society as a whole. Yeah, and I think that's where people will start to look at institutions like your own, right, to be the one who is doing the thought leadership to say, well, look, you know, you can collaborate and you can still do it with powered by AI as well. And the key thing about us as an institute that people need to remember is actually we don't do the thought leadership, our members do. Right. We create the ecosystem, our members come along and do the really intelligent stuff of coming up with the thought leadership papers. Got it, got it. And it's that they've obviously got like commercial imperatives to mm -hmm. make sure that it, 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 it works and they're utilizing, yeah. But everything is pretty much, is everything is gonna be powered by uh, at some point in the future anyway. So yeah. Um, so we talked uh, about ICW, we talked uh, a bit about the ethos. We, um, tell me a little bit about the, the culture in, in the business as well. Um, the culture is very positive. Mm -hmm. uh, we're a small organization. We, you know, we, we, we spend our members money carefully. Um, um, but we are becoming a more professional organization. Um, I'm a great believer and you will know this from, from us working together in the past, Rob. Yeah. I believe you do things the right way. You should always be professional about what you do. Mm -hmm. um, never do things the easy way or the quick way. Do it the right way, yeah. uh, and you will get the reward. So so the Institute is, is changing a little, I think, under my leadership in that um, I'm insisting on a little more process. Um, I want systems that work for us as an Institute. Mm -hmm. um, I want us to have far more direct interaction with our members, so a much more open, uh, open-armed institutes, if you like, as in terms of communicating with our members. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, to improve our systems and improve the professionalism of what we do. That's not to say it was unprofessional before, mm -hmm. but I believe you need to continue to improve on, on where you are. So, mm -hmm. so uh, but we're very friendly. We're very open-minded. We all get on well together. Um, and uh, and it wouldn't be unusual to find us having a beer in the pub together uh, on a Thursday evening or something after a, a couple of hard days in the office. Very good. Well, you always need that, right? Because it's, it's a case of, it's not just work, work, work. It, without that, it's, you need a bit of play to, to be able to bond teams, right? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so your processes and you know you're putting more things in place, which means that there's more definition of effectively how the work is done, right? And and who does it? Ah, good. 
and also maybe some sort of like review approval chain type thing going on there or uh, yeah we're putting more uh, structure into our uh, if, if you like our technical integrity of what we're producing mm -hmm. um, and we have clearly demarcations of whose responsibility it is to manage or to oversee different aspects of what we do. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really important because it enables people to understand what their roles are very mm. clearly and to focus on those deliverables. Right. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking a little segue there. Like, could at some point AI even be involved in then making the decision whether or not something's passed or, you know. Oh, I think AI will make decisions in the past, in the future. Yeah. Um, I mean, to some extent, AI always... Uh, gives you advice on decisions on the road, doesn't it? You know, this is the, this is the best route to take to get from A to B. True. Um, yeah, Netflix, you know, that's all kind of powered by, yeah. 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 Um, so, uh, yeah, I think, I think we'll, we just need to gain that trust. Yeah. 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 I suppose that's, that's the other thing. When you don't see it, you don't really know it's there, but if, it, yeah, you just have to know how to maybe tweak it so that it works for the benefit of all, really. We didn't really go into too much detail about technology. Are you guys using any technologies at the minute to like help you? Grow? I mean, obviously without saying the AI word again, but what are you doing to like put new things in place? Um, we are, we're currently doing a bit of a, some work in our database, mm -hmm. our member database to make sure it's as up to date and accurate as it can be. Right. Um, so we've got someone in doing a project on that at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we're looking to sort of similar to yourself, we're, we're looking, we get lots of inquiries coming in. Uh, historically, they've been handled by individuals. Um, so we're looking to put in some systems to enable us to track inquiries in so that we don't lose inquiries and, I suspect that we've lost inquiries in the past because through human error. So, so we are looking as part of our professionalism, moving to a more professional institute to put some fairly simple systems in place. But we're only a relatively small institute, so that will come in time. Mm -hmm. um, and as part of our five-year strategic plan, uh, we realise that we will have to improve uh, some of our systems during that five-year journey as well. So it's it's right. in there, but probably a year. Of, 18 months to two years away from significant investments there, I think. Okay. You know a bit about the business and where you're trying to take things as well. Tell me about you. Like, wh what do you do when you're not working at the ICW? What, what's your typical day, like at a weekend or something? Okay. Well, wow. Um, I love going to the gym. Everybody knows that. <laughs> I mean, people tell me I'm a gym boy because I love going to the gym. Yeah. Um, so, and I still do it, even at 60, whatever it is now, I still go. Yeah, I love yeah. football. You know, Rob, I love football. I know you do, yeah. And I'm a mad keen Man United fan. I won't <laughs> go any longer, but I tend to watch it pretty much on the TV these days. But yeah. I love the football. Um, me and my wife, we've just um, uh, taken a place at Lytham on the coast, uh, which is a lovely part of the world. And, mm -hmm. and we just love to go for long walks uh, at weekends. Um, and of course... You also probably remember I'm a bit of a real ale uh, lover, so it would not be unusual to find me hanging out in the pub as well. So, um, so yeah, a couple of beers, a game of football, after some nice walks and a trip to the gym will be my perfect Saturday, I think. Wow, Frank, you've got it sus, man. That's, <laughs> a, that's a kind of like ideal life for me as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm not saying it happens every week. So that's the ideal day. Yeah, that's the ideal. Okay, good, good, good. I, uh, so what about your love of football with Man U? Like, I mean... We've had on, a yeah. barren few years. I have to <laughs> admit, yeah. But I'm, I'm optimistic under our new manager about the future. Yeah. I think he does have a plan. Right, and it's always important in any uh, aspect of life to have a plan. Yeah, and I've got confidence in him. So, yeah, good. So, well, so I'm optimistic for the future. And if he wants to collaborate, you know, with a if he needs any help and guidance, he knows where he can come. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, great. Um, and so that's a gr like a typical weekend and so on well, tell me about like just a little bit you know without going into a whole f f long career that you've had how you've how you kind of got started with business life in just general and then what happened up until like i guess bsi days but obviously like a whirlwind tour oh, okay well, wow all right um i left school at 16 
Right. Uh, I walked away with one all level and, and the four or five, what used to be called CSE, Certificates of Secondary Education, they lost in the mists of time. Right. Um, I was a little bit of a slow developer, if I'm perfectly honest. Uh, I went to work for a company called Sibagayi, um, and they sent me to uh, day release and night school. Right. Um, eventually qualifying as a chemist. Um, you were I, a chemist? Yeah, yeah. And I worked in pharmaceutical, uh, as a bench chemist, pharmaceutical research and development at CBA. Mm-hmm. And I did that for 17 years, actually, or, or my total career with, with CBA guy, it was 17 years. Wow. Um, and then I, um, I moved to, to BSI. I got fed up of looking at grey powders and decided I wanted to speak to people. <laughs> and I became a client manager at BSI. And then, you know, shortly afterwards, or around that time, I was married to, to Marie and our children came along, mm-hmm. Michael, Rebecca, and later Mark. Yeah. Um, the job as a client manager was my first job in BSI. Gave me a fantastic ground and told me all about business, things I didn't know about people. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I went on to have a multitude of different jobs in in BSI. Yeah. I always remember the first day thinking, gosh, what a really complex organization it's this. How will I ever work out what they do? Yeah. And like 25 years later, I found myself as technical director of the organization or something. And you think, how did that happen? Why did those years go? <laughs> yeah. um, um, my last job was a job I loved, uh, working with uh, Matt Page, yes. uh, who's a fantastic leader. Uh, and I even in my 60s working with Matt, I still learn stuff from him. Right. Really. Okay. I, I, and um, and uh, my role was uh, UK and Ireland Product Certification Director. That was the, the kite mark, the yeah. mark and, and those, those areas. So really enjoyed that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and if I was to give advice on a career to anyone, uh, it would be... Um, Keep changing roles, keeps you interested. Yeah. Um, uh, don't do something for too long. You can still say good organizations give you the opportunity to take on new roles and move around. Right. Uh, uh, look for new challenges. Um, Did you ever look for the challenges or were they presented to you? Um, both. Right. Um, and sometimes, you know, we mentioned serendipity a little earlier. Sometimes yeah. it just happens. You just happen to be the right person in the right place. Yeah, yeah. You can be the wrong person in the wrong place as <laughs> yeah, well. that can equally that happen. Happened. Yes, um, yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, quite often, you know, you're, you, the role will come up and you think, I really fancy that job, I really want to do it, and you'll yeah. apply and you'll do well and you'll get it. But other times they just, they just fall into your hand. Yeah, um, yeah, and other times are really disappointing ones. Of course, are the ones that you really want and don't get. Yeah. Um, uh, Did that ever happen to you? Where you oh, kind of? Yeah, I, there, there was three occasions in my career where I went for jobs that I really wanted and didn't get them. Right. And, and I think the, the important thing when that happens to a person uh, is a that you are resilient about it and you accept that those things do happen. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, don't go away licking your wounds and crying over it. You. Get up and carry on. Yeah, and I think for the organisation, and I also particularly think for the people who work, or the those that work in the people part of an organisation, yeah, need to abs- be absolutely clear that their recruitment processes have been done correctly, because right. you know they are talking about people's lives here. It's not, yeah. it's not a simple thing, um, and they take the time out to really explain to that person why they didn't get it, and help them move on towards their next one. Right. Um, but I think if all those things come together, yeah, you can still have a very, very successful career. Sure. I think you're talking probably more from an internal perspective with the yeah. organization. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. So no, that's that's definitely good advice for anybody who's kind of in a, 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 a I guess, large organization um, trying to think about maybe what's my next move. Maybe it is in that organization, but maybe it is something sideways or maybe diagonal. Diagonally normally is a good way to go, in diagonal. my experience, yeah. Very good. Because you always learn lots of new tools, lots of new techniques, and get a different aspect on a business. Yeah. Um, and the other thing I'd say to anybody <laughs> in any career is that if you go into every situation with an open mind, then every conversation you have is an opportunity to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I look at the role I'm doing now, I often think, I've been training for 50 years to do this role. Yeah, yeah. Because um, everything I've done before has been a training exercise. Yeah. 
even though it's been a real job. It's still, <laughs> you're still learning, you're still training, you're still getting, yeah. hopefully getting better. Oh my gosh, I, I can think of a couple of questions already to ask you there, but, um, and I'll hold them for now, right? But when, actually, I'll just ask them straight away. So when you say like you were, new things that you're learning, what, what are the new things that you're starting to learn about the CEO gig versus? Okay, uh, so I think there's a number. Um, Firstly, there's a responsibility yeah. that you only get in this role, um, A, to the organization as a whole and to the people within the organization. We all are responsible for the people that work yeah. uh, in our organizations. But as CEO, you really, that becomes very, you become acutely aware of that. Uh, and the yeah. future of the organization is very much in your hands. People right. are always looking to you for leadership, for decisions, for clarity. Um, so, so I'm learning that. I'm also learning about the, the real value of ensuring that your organization always provides as much value as it can and behaves in a way that is always ethical, always honest, mm. um, and always true to its values. Yeah, it's funny um, you should say that. Everything that you say, I, I tell my team about as well. I feel keenly, keenly responsible for everybody who... Yeah sits in here and works here it's it's hard is it lonely um i'm fortunate i have a very supportive chairman um who is always willing to listen um and actually doesn't give a great deal of advice but certainly helps you calibrate where you are he's, he's an experienced uh, man and, and he's a great help and i have a very good team and a very strong team. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, there are, there are days when it can, you know, there's be a few issues knocking around and you think, oh gosh, what am I going to do here? Yeah. Um, but you get through them. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, that's true. I mean, same for me. The buck stops with me at the end of the day. But, and you can't really, sometimes you just have to make decisions based on not just qualitative data, but just gut sometimes. Yeah. It's important to remember those, those key lessons all about making decisions. Never make a decision when you're angry. Mm. Never make a decision when you're very happy. Take emotion out of decisions. And sometimes just give yourself a little time. Because there's, uh, in, in business life today, there's, I think, often a pressure to make decisions quickly. And sometimes... Just give yourself that little bit of time to think before making that decision. Yeah. Uh, I, think it's, it's, I think it's good advice anyway. Yeah, no, I'll definitely try and remember that one. And I'm, I, you know, I never really thought about the one, no, don't make decisions when you're too happy because, yeah, you're right. Sometimes you might just end up making something that's a bit careless and yep. reckless. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely for all of you budding CEOs or business owners out there, some really good advice. And, and the other thing... Um, Maybe a follow-on from that, if I may. Um, admit your f you don't know everything. Mm. So actually, admit the things that you're not that good at. Because there'll be someone who is good at them who can help you. But the first thing you have to do is you have to admit to yourself that you're not good at something. And then you can start to do something about it. Yeah. Um, and I won't say the person's name, but the worst leader I ever worked for, his biggest fault was he couldn't admit what he couldn't do. Right. Yeah. Be open about it. Be yeah. truthful. And then sometimes as well, you know, when you've got somebody who can't admit something, they, they think they might not secretly admit it, but then they will try to do something about it. But because they haven't admitted it in, in the first place, they end up just shooting themselves in the foot because... Mm -hmm. If you can't, you're not good at something, get somebody else to do it. Yep. You know, yeah, it's absolutely. not always yeah. you, you have, you don't have to do everything good all the time to everyone. No. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's really, really good advice, Frank. Thank you so much for coming into the podcast and also to share all of the amazing insights that you've built up as a leader in uh, a, a tremendous career over the last how many years? 50 years. 50 years, Frank. So yeah, uh, we've we've been so lucky to have benefited from the knowledge and experience that you've had. And um, for all of those who are actually watching the podcast, you've got a great insight into what it takes to be somebody who's not just all, all 
not just been a leader, but also somebody who's survived and moved from one organization, tremendous organization, to an equally other impressive one as well. So keep watching and find out more about how you can hear more stories like this from our podcast. If you want to find out any more about Frank and his amazing organization, the ICW, please click in the description and don't forget to like and share. Thank you.